by the UN General Assembly. Oh, that's right, and we're being recorded too. Um, so brief overview of the SDGs. Um, it's a set of 17 global goals adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2015. They range from a focus on ending world hunger to protecting life underwater, climate action, and of course, what we're going to be discussing today, industry, infrastructure, and innovation. One unique thing about the SDGs that I personally connect to the most and feel is the most valuable piece of this framework is the interconnectedness. So each SDG is going to relate to one or more of the other SDGs in some way or another. And I think that that's a really unique way to approach the many problems that we are being faced with in our global arena today. So that's something that I really appreciate about the SDGs. And again, today, since we're doing SDG 9, Bonnie and Ro found us a really nice little summary video just to give us an idea about uh, what SDG 9 is. So I'm going to share my screen so that we can all watch that together. Okay. Do we see this? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Industry and innovation relies on effective infrastructure like safe roads, transportation, clean water and electricity to function on a local and international level. We all have a role to play in helping the UN achieve its goal to create a world where everyone has access to improve infrastructure, industry and innovation by the year 2030 because when good infrastructure is in place, entrepreneurs can make existing products and services even better and nations prosper for the benefit of everyone. Infrastructure is all around us. It's the sidewalks we walk on, the reservoirs that supply running water, the data centers that link us up to the internet. When infrastructure is strong, people are able to connect and work together on new innovations. And this, in turn, creates more jobs and supports a thriving economy. Roads and bridges allow goods to be transported from producers to retailers. They enable people to get to work when roads are in good condition and adequately serviced. Economies run smoothly. When the tropical storm Nate hit the South American countries of Costa Rica, Nicaragua and Honduras in 2017, flash floods and landslides damaged countless roads and bridges, making it difficult for relief to make its way to where it was most needed. Lots of businesses were affected, meaning the economies of those countries suffered too. Communities with damaged infrastructure can remain without water and electricity for weeks or months after a natural disaster. But they can also bounce back, as was the case in the Chinese province of Sichuan, which was devastated by an earthquake in 2008, but hosted the Olympics just three years later thanks to an investment in the region's infrastructure. In Kenya, improved internet connectivity is enabling citizens to exchange money person to person, making it possible for farmers to conduct direct transactions with retailers using mobile money apps like M-Pesa. In India, national, state and local governments are committed to boosting rural development by collaborating on the Smart Village Initiative. They're transforming underdeveloped villages into model villages by investing in sanitation, new roads, and sustainable energies. When we have access to good infrastructure, we can innovate, create, and drive industry forward so that everyone benefits together. Okay, now that we have a brief overview of what SDG 9 is, I will pass it on to Ro to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Joaria. I'd like to introduce to all of you a longtime Marin entrepreneur, and he's a resident, um, Chris Yolanis. He has 30 years of experience in software development, marketing <coughs> research, and customer development. He was a founder team member of pre-IPO Autodesk marketing team. Um, he was SurveyMonkey platform co-architect, and he's been a professional services and advisor to many businesses. He's present, president and co-founder of VenturePad in downtown San Rafael, 
which supports and promotes a dynamic cross-section of for-profits, non-profits, government agencies, and academia, academia. And along with being a co-working space and meeting center, VenturePad is an incubator, launching 15 to 25 new businesses a year in Marin and surrounding areas, all within a context of sustainability. So, Chris, go ahead. Thank Great. you for joining us this afternoon. Thank, thank you, everyone. I'm going to share uh, some, uh, uh, my screen here. I've, I've only got about 200 slides, um, but um, we, we, we should be uh, able to cover them in a few minutes. So uh, you better start laughing now because they're, they're not getting any better. So let me uh, share the screen here. Yeah, let me go back. So thanks for, for having me. Um, this is a, a, an interesting uh, chapter that I'm just starting to get to know. And uh, uh, I've been mostly hyper-local in, in a lot of the work that I've been doing with economic development, innovation. And uh, so it's, it's been a really good excuse for me to go global and then zero in on, on what these SDGs mean for uh, us locally. And um, sometimes these map pretty well, the SDGs do to, to Marin, but sometimes uh, they don't. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit about um, what, what is relevant in, in my view about S the SDG number nine to Marin, what works uh, in terms of economic development benchmarks and industry and innovation benchmarks. Um, and, um, and really also look at, at uh, our, our economy locally um, and how do we characterize it? Uh, how are we doing in terms of greening our economy and incorporating some of these uh, SDG or even broader sustainability and, and regeneration kind of, of values that uh, we're as a county uh, well known for, but also entering into um, economic development um, sort of uh, processes. And, um, and then how do we attract and retain companies and organizations that, that really matter to us and, and relate to the values that we hold dear? Um, and, I, and if we have some time, I'm going to bring in um, some of the work locally that's happening uh, around climate change mitigation, adaptation, because it, it directly affects um, our jobs, uh, job creation, um, some of the, the industry and ecosystems that we're trying to develop around, around things like uh, carbon farming or around circular economies or around electrification of transportation uh, and, uh, and of buildings. So, um, you know, we were, we were just talking about how the SDGs are very interrelated. And I think number nine and um, it has impact, uh, you know, across a number of, of the other SDGs. So what's our goal here? Why are we, as a little county, um, 261,000 people, um, why is this important to us? Well, we want to understand um, how our infrastructure, our, our economy, our built environment, uh, our culture of, culture of, of uh, diversity or of inclusion or of growth or not, um, how, do we, how do we promote that? And how do we imbue these efforts uh, with the values, again, of, of sustainability, uh, of inclusiveness, uh, of regeneration. Um, a, a lot of our economic growth, a lot of our, our social development, our culture, um, our evolution as a, as a community, as well as action around climate, it, it's dependent on, on in our infrastructure, um, on how we develop our, our, res our uh, housing, um, our commercial buildings, our roads, our bridges, how we treat our natural um, ecosystems, especially around tidelands and, uh, and wetlands that are proving to be one of some of the most effective uh, bulwarks against uh, sea level and bay level rises. Um, we, we also wanted to make sure that 
as we plan our economic growth and, and, and envision what we want as an economy and a community, that we address accessibility and being able to um, have these opportunities, whether it be jobs or, or housing um, or the ability to have a voice, we, we need to do a better job at making sure that uh, all of our communities are, are included. Um, some of you might have been, been reading about uh, inequality, uh, inequality, especially around um, housing, uh, income, um, career laddering. Um, and unfortunately, Marin does not have a good history in that. In fact, uh, just this past year, after being number one, we're now at number two of the most inequality uh, or in, inequitable counties in the whole state. So we have a lot of work to be do, done uh, around uh, economic uh, inequality. And then we, we also wanna make sure that as, as we progress our, in, in developing our, our future economy and community, that we, we continue to innovate. We don't stay stagnant. And we, have, we wanna make sure that anything that we put in place um, in terms of infrastructure or structures, uh, government agencies are resilient. They're flexible enough. And we see that especially around flooding now, and we see it around fire. These are two uh, eminent dangers that we as a community face. And we're seeing infrastructure and new agencies being developed around resilience. And I've been in the sustainability field for a number of years now. And just this past year or two, um, resilience has now really become a, a really key element to how we want to grow um, and, and, and how we envision our future as a community. The trouble is our, our traditional ways of looking at economic development of growth and innovation typically are, are, are not really working very well for this new, new economy visions that we have. So for example, GDP or the number of business starts or the number of, of of revenues through our economy doesn't really distinguish between good and bad things. It's, it's just dollars flowing through uh, and, and how we're transacting. So if you look at, at, at oil spills, for example, down in BP, down in the Gulf or off of, off of uh, so SoCal um, coast uh, this last year, um, it actually grew the economy in terms of expenditures. Now, it, that's not the kind of spending that we're looking for. So we have to be a little conscious just to, to, to be looking at GDP and, uh, and growth because, you know, here in Marin in the Bay Area, it's been, you know, pretty healthy. Uh, it's been in the, the three to five percent range in the past year or two. Um, but it's certainly not an equitable growth. Um, and the distribution of income um, is uh, is a real uh, has been a real challenge I think for us as a community. So we've doubled our national income. In fact, uh, Marin has, has even more than doubled over thirty years. Um, but the average income of the average households have, have not seen uh, much gain. You uh, know, in, in terms of income, and we know this in. You know, when we when we listen to our economic analysts and our our progressive um, champions of better distribution, but uh, of, of of wealth, um, but it, it it's it's a it's a been a a, 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 a a tough challenge to to be able to overcome this, and and we're still in the middle of of trying to make that happen. And and as I mentioned, Marin is ranked number two in the whole state for inequality of income. So we've got some real work there. And, and our, our typical uh, metrics, again, are, are not uh, sh showing this phenomenon as well as it needs to. Um, GDP and a lot of these economic development metrics do not account for our natural ecosystems and our natural resources. So you know, if we went out and we caught all the crab um, or fished out all the salmon off of our coast, um, and didn't have fishery management, um, we would that that industry would be in in, in woeful state. And, and we see salmon, for example, uh, that that industry being uh, really affected by by even by climate change, uh, by the, uh, the 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 lack of of rain uh, filling our um, our streams so that that our salmon can spawn. 
and of course all the all the competing uh, sectors for for fresh water. Um, you, you know, Marin has had um, I think a, a you know a very uh, strong uh, culture now in in its past fifty years of natural capital protection ecosystem services, and we've got some wonderful stories of of being able to hold off development um, through the years. And, and, and we're at now about 80 to 82% of our land uh, in the county is, un, is, is protected. It's either park, open space, um, uh, under the natural uh, park system. So we should be, you know, feel very good about that. Now that's got a cost to us also in terms of how we can accommodate um, New, uh, new building and uh, affordable housing uh, building. And the stock is woefully inadequate, as we know. Um, and so, you know, that's, a, that's one of the great challenges that we have as a community. Um, and then finally, some of these, these metrics aren't reflecting things that, that don't have a price, but they're still very good for our society. You know, volunteer hours. Marin's got 1,500 nonprofits. Uh, it's the highest nonprofit number per capita in the whole country. So we have a, a wonderful culture of giving back, of contributing. Um, so we should feel proud of that and we need to be able to tap that, that resource that we have. So what should be in the way we look at, at our economic development, our infrastructure, our, our community development? What should be some of the elements that need to be a, a part of that? The reason why I'm bringing this up is that Marin County has never had an economic development strategy actually uh, uh, developed uh, and codified. And it's, it's, it's hard to believe, but um, we, we, economic development has just been a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a neglected sort of stepchild um, in our evolution. And we, we have a, a very woefully inadequate number of resources geared to it. Um, we spend probably a half a million to a million dollars a year total on staffing and, and, uh, and grant making uh, for economic development. In contrast, Sonoma spends about $6 million a year on economic development of attraction and, and uh, retention of, of businesses. Um, and they're, they're double our size, but um, they spend six times as much on economic development. But here are some things that I'm encouraging um, our, our business leaders and our economic development professionals. And I'd like to get you on board with these and make sure that in your advocacy, uh, in your uh, work with your nonprofits or your advocacy groups or your attendance um, on council and local agency, uh, meetings that, that we're looking at these, these elements. Um, and I'm not going to necessarily go through all of them, but, but many of you are involved in, in, in these issues at, a, at a, uh, either a national or, or lo local level. But we've, for the most part, have got um, some efforts being done in all of these areas uh, and starting to incorporate them into general plans, um, into climate action plans, economic de development plans, I hope, at least uh, this, this next year. Um, so clean air, uh, clean energy, climate action plans are um, getting a lot of uh, attention. All of the municipalities for the most part now have uh, caps. Uh, Marin uh, as a county, just the past uh, two or three months approved a climate action plan for the next 10 years for the county, updated it. Uh, water, of course, has been uh, on a lot of people's minds, and we're uh, so we still need a longer-term um, approach to the to, to water conservation and infrastructure. Um, it looks like the the pipeline coming across the Richmond Bay Bridge, um, or Richmond Bridge rather, is is on hold. Um, and uh, but we've still got to we, we've still got to consider. Um, building some infrastructure. It, right now, it's, it's looking like that pipeline will, uh, is, is our most viable um, short and midterm solution to, to these shortages. And uh, uh, we've got to make sure that, that we have a, a longer term perspective on that. Just because our, our reservoirs are at 90% capacity doesn't mean that uh, in another year or two that uh, they're going to be, we're going to 
you know, still have have a have real challenge with with uh, with with our, our water. Um, the electrification of both our buildings and our transportation networks and, and vehicles are um, a, a long term effort. Um, and so our our infrastructure, our economic development plans need to accommodate um, the, the transformation of that of that built environment as well as our our fossil um, fossil fuel vehicles over to to electric uh, product stewardship. Um, is in here only because it has a lot to do with our, our waste uh, infrastructure. And what I mean by product stewardship is making sure that um, those, those organizations selling products, doing business in our county, has a responsibility uh, and a plan uh, and a mechanism for end of life and of the reuse of, of their products. So we need to be constantly thinking about as we consume products or as we, we attract product companies into the county um, that they have uh, a, 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 an approach and a, and a value system that says, all right, at the end of life in the sourcing of the products, we wanna make sure these, these product components um, can be reused. They can come back into the sourcing element uh, to the to manufacturing process. Um, and, uh, and we get rid of this single use mentality, especially around plastics. Of course, equity and climate justice is an important element that is making its way more and more into our climate action plans. Um, we have uh, a, a lot of vulnerability uh, around flooding in two of our um, BIPOC communities, uh, Marin City, with the Manzanita exit, uh, we know is is ripe for flooding. Uh, with uh, just about every king tide now, and um, it's a it's a, a real challenge for us. Um, and then the canal uh, is just about number one or number two most vulnerable community in the whole Bay Area for sea level rise, Bay, bay level rise. So uh, these are are two. Uh, areas uh, of, um, of underdevelopment. Um, and we want to make sure that in our climate action work, um, that we consider those two communities and make sure that uh, uh, they have access to opportunities and grants and funding uh, for, uh, for dealing with, with flooding in, in those communities. A little bit about VenturePad. I, I, I was setting the, the, those, those slides up for you because I wanted to kind of set a, a stage in which we launched VenturePad about five years ago. Um, my co-founder and I, Alejandro Moreno, uh, both of us had, had done graduate work in, um, in sustainable management. And we had been active with other incubators um, and accelerators here in the county. And, um, but we also saw that that the um, two of our accelerators um, were, were going out of business. They had lost their grants. So there was a real paucity of, of good, uh, good places for people to be able to start businesses, uh, especially ones that, that have impact and, and have social con uh, uh, construct. So we, we started VenturePad um, and we're right downtown San Rafael. Um, we're in our, we just graduated our, our, or just celebrated our fifth year. Um, COVID's been tough for us, but we're clawing our way back. Uh, but it is really designed to support and activate um, uh, entrepreneurship. And whether you're in within a big company or, or a small company, uh, we help you with affordable space and access to capital and, and uh, access to, 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 to advisors. And we, we've really found that a lot of people working from home, especially now in our coming into our, our third year of COVID, um, we, we find that a lot of people are feeling isolated and um, even distracted working from home. And we know that we have a, a big migration to, to work at home. And um, so we're going to you know, serve that, that community. And you know, the, the jury's still out on, on how work will be redefined by, by COVID. But we've been fortunate to be recognized uh, as uh, uh, being green and we like to model that. And, um, we like to, 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 uh, to promote uh, sustainable business practices uh, in the community. 
We started our accelerator about a year ago, and really the accelerator is designed to take young companies and get them to market um, as it, and successfully and then help them scale uh, their operations, either through uh, great advice and mentorship, um, a, a cohort of, of peer entrepreneurs that can help uh, the, the founders, um, and then also uh, just access to capital and funding, whether it be uh, uh, venture capital or angel money or uh, preparing a, a deck even for friends and family uh, and, and raising money for them. Um, so, so that's what the accelerator is about. Any of you who um, are uh, aware of, of young companies or founders that could benefit from some of these services, uh, please point them to, to VenturePad. And we're happy to, to take a look at uh, uh, what they need, see if we can help them. So we, again, th these are just some of the things that we're helping uh, our, our young companies with. So here's examples of some small companies that have done well. Uh, they're still in business for the most part. Uh, this, these are companies just in the past seven or eight years that have been incubated and, and, ex, and uh, launched here in Marin that have a, some kind of element of, of sustainability, whether it be renewables or circular systems or storytelling for progressive uh, businesses. Um, and uh, they've, they've done well. These are examples of really hot startups that in the past 10 years have gone public or have actually been, been uh, acquired. And you'll see it, the, the, most of them are in the med tech or, or um, sort of biotech area. A little farther down uh, towards the bottom is Enphase and Zip Solar. Um, and both those companies have been in the solar uh, industry sector and have done very well. So um, and, and Enphase, of course, was, was sold to a, a Solar City. Solar City was bought by Tesla. We know how well Tesla has done uh, over the past few years in terms of its, of its value. Um, Zip Solar has done well. Um, and again, these companies have been able to be valued uh, you know, in, the, in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, as, uh, as they've, they've exited um, for their investors. So incubation acceleration works here in Marin, and uh, we want to make sure that we encourage and, and support our, our young companies. All right, I'm going to keep going. How, how are we doing on time? Um, we're about close to wanting to take questions. So okay. if there's any final ideas, we can wrap up and take questions. All right, let's do that. Um, I, I wanted, wanted to throw out a couple of my favorite success stories. Um, Strategic Energy Innovations is SEI. They have a, uh, their mission is around youth education for sustainability and uh, regeneration. And uh, please support them if you can. It's called Strategic Energy Innovations. They've got a um, a school within a school at Terra Linda High School called MCEL, uh, Marin School of Environmental Leadership, teach uh, young people at the intersection of entrepreneurship and sustainability. It's, it's wonderful. Strauss, of course, has been around a while, but it's one of my favorite farms. Um, and uh, I, I love uh, Albert Strauss's electric truck that's powered by cows. So if any of you don't know that story, uh, Google the electric truck. So basically Albert's got a feed truck uh, that's electric and it's uh, charged, the batteries are charged by a turbine that's powered by methane, a methane digester uh, that is fed by the cows, right? So it's a nice little circular system. Uh, the, the cows poop and, and pee, uh, that methane gets burned the, it turns a turbine, generates electricity for the electric batteries, and, and Albert's got an electric truck. I think it was the first one in the country that, uh, that was doing that. So anyway, those are just some, some, uh, some young companies and, and nonprofits that, that we really... Marin Airport, how many of you uh, are, fam are, are familiar with, with Marin Airport? That's Bob Herp's um, uh, outfit, and, and it's, he's... He was the, the first and largest private solar farm in California when he started it. This was about six years ago. He put solar on all of his hangars and uh, is generating a, a, a megawatt uh, output and um, powers about 800 homes here in Marin. And now it's, you know, it's pretty common now to have uh, 
uh, some, some pretty large solar farms uh, throughout the North Bay. All right, so I think um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up right now here. Um, let me just share with you, though, sort of our, our, how our climate change, what I call climate change capitalism, can help with our economic development. And I mean, today, um, we've got about 12,000 employers. Um, we, we've got, now these are, again, companies that have uh, employees, right? They're, they're not sole proprietors. We have another 40,000 people who are self-employed, right? But, you know, as, as you can see from this chart, a lot of healthcare, a lot of professional technical services. Um, Real estate is a big driver of our industry, professional services, uh, government uh, enterprises. And we've got a number of things that we need to do for our, our companies to, to attract them and hold them. And I'm, I'm, happy, I'm gonna share with you these slides are gonna make, be, be available, but um, the county is working with our business community to work on, on alleviating some of the challenges that we've got in, in attracting and retaining the kind of companies that we want. Um, and some of these are, are listed here. So this is an example of, of, of some of the actions over the next several years that we're gonna be doing around climate uh, change mitigation. Um, I, I believe that we can map a lot of these initiatives and very local projects to workforce development. We can, we can also, um, make sure that, that the vendors, that the solution providers um, are, are encouraged and incented to hire and to train new people um, and, and work hand in hand with our local governments with incentives um, and, uh, and, and the right kind of training. So these are all shovel ready projects that the county um, and Drawdown Marin, which is our climate action plan for the county, they're, they're earmarked to, to be working on. And all of these have implications for, for, uh, um, for, um, for hiring. Uh, these are examples of, of some restoration projects throughout the Bay that's, we've got about $4 million now just allocated uh, for wetlands restoration and for, for uh, sea level rise uh, uh, bulwarks. Um, so there's money being spent today on, on adaptation. It's not just a future thing. So lots of job creation opportunities um, in transportation, uh, in industry itself, waste and, and water, uh, energy debt generation, even natural ecosystem uh, management. So that, that is, kind of wraps things up. I, I went a little bit faster than I wanted to um, on, the, on the economic development side related to climate. But um, I think uh, you know, one of the main points I think that the takeaways is we have an opportunity as a community as we um, address climate change mitigation and, and adaptation, we have an opportunity to, to put some of our, our folks to work uh, in these new sectors and make sure that the, that the jobs are, um, are well-paying, that, uh, that the, the right kind of jobs um, that, that have real meaning and impact. And um, that's my, my vision for, uh, again, combining this, this opportunity to create the right kind of jobs uh, with, with climate change um, and, and with sustainability uh, improvements. So that's about it, folks. I'm, I'm ready to open up to, to some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Let's quick round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to just unmute and ask. Hi, this is uh, <clears throat> from Paul. How, how are we all doing today? Um, hey, Paul. Yeah, good to see you again. And thank you for that really interesting uh, presentation. Really. Uh, some really fascinating ideas, and uh, thank you for for Roe and Bonnie for for getting you uh, on board. But my question for you is: uh, so um, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, thing for us to think about, which is the the business world and capitalism and all that sort of thing. It's not typically uh, a topic we 
we we speak about it, but boy, is it essential. Mm. Can you can you tell me from your viewpoint and your experience what is the major challenge? Um, that uh, an entrepreneur faces in the Marin? What are the things that hold them back? Uh, and is there anything that we could do in a public policy realm to make it more, um, you know, more easy for them to, to do their work and to, and to provide the benefit? Thanks. Sure. Yeah, good question. Um, on average, about two, 200 to 300 new business licenses are issued every, every year here in Marin. Most of them are, are sole proprietors, you know, they're small shops. Um, and that doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't encourage those small shops, but we should also encourage um, companies that, that really want to scale, um, and especially that have good social, environmental, economic impact, um, pay their people well, um, you know, keep the, uh, the sourcing and, and hiring local. That doesn't mean that you know, you, you, you can't go uh, outside of the area because it's, it's, it's hard to, to, uh, to hire great talent here in the county. Uh, so the biggest challenge that, that we're hearing from our, our founders and entrepreneurs, number one is that um, access to talent is their biggest challenge. You know, they just can't seem to find um, great software developers or technicians or even great technical salespeople here locally, and the, and the you know the, as as we know the, the, the really the, the biggest problem is is the cost of housing. Uh, about fifty percent of our workforce is commuting in every day to Marin. Now it's skewed because of the pandemic and the work of work at home migration, um, but. We suspect that things will set, when things start to settle down um, and the commuter patterns kind of get back to whatever they're going to get back to uh, and, 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 and settle in, that we'll have, uh, you know, as, as, as many as, uh, um, as 50, 60 percent uh, of people of our workforce coming in. So, again, we've got to make it easier and there's no quick fix around accessing good employees you know, for, for startups or for existing companies. But we have absolutely got to keep the, the foot on the, on the accelerator around affordable housing. And, um, you know, we've got to continue to pressure um, our, uh, our councils and, and, um, and our planners to, um, you know, to, to look, uh, you know, smartly at, at housing that is, uh, um, you know, is transit oriented. Um, I, you know, I'm a big believer in, in uh, JDUs and, and uh, uh, ADUs, you know, the accessory dwelling units, making that easy to, to develop for, for, for uh, residents. Um, but also I think we, we just, we, we do have to continue to embrace, um, you know, remote working. And, um, you know, that's, I think for the short term is going to be uh, also in a you know way to access good talent. The, the second thing that we've got to provide for our entrepreneurs is, is access to, to capital. And uh, that's sort of the, the number two biggest challenge for a lot of these young companies um, because after fr and friends and family money is really you know how 90% of our, our entrepreneurs are getting funds. Um, you know they're, they're uh, uh, funding it themselves you know uh, with their with their own savings or uh, or with their their lines of credit and uh, we've just got to make it easier with revolving loan funds with with other kind of development uh, funds to to be able to uh, build those so entrepreneurs have have just a little little better access you know to, to capital so those would be the, the the two biggest things and of course uh, in a, a self-serving way I'd like them like us to really support our accelerators and, 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 and incubators, because um, I think that's important for our, our, our founders also. Great, thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. I have a quick question, yeah. um, Chris. Can you just tell me, does the county have and offer financial incentives for these um, small companies or these new companies? Um, <clears throat> For their to produce green products um, and to support um, green policies. Well, I, 
I would say no. We 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 have grants. Um, we have. Uh, uh, so we're starting to see a, some private investors that are funding sort of green product ideas, uh, but it's still at its infancy. Um, the, 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 the county has a, uh, a, a, a green business network that um, they will come out to your business and help you go through a checklist on green business practices. And then these are things like, being a deep green customer of MCE, for example, right? You know, you, you, your electricity that you buy are 100% renewable. Or um, you source uh, your cleaning products all through non-toxic suppliers. Um, your furniture uh, is made up of, of sustainably harvested wood, for example, uh, or flooring. Uh, or your products, again, have... Uh, toxicity taken out of them and you know the the the, the, the ingredients of, of a consumable um, you know it has has is, is, is healthy has low negative impact so we have a certification and there's about four or five hundred companies in Marin that are certified green as part of this network and the and the county promotes them um, not not well enough uh, but in terms of getting money to them now unfortunately we, we don't have that and uh, Marin has, you know, not been able to develop a, a great uh, private equity or a venture capital community um, that I think, you know, we, we've seen this in San Francisco and, and even Oakland and certainly the, you know, Silicon Valley develop. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a, a, a world famous uh, ecosystem that they have developed in terms of, of uh, venture capital and angel investing. Um, but uh, we've got some work to do, you know, around around access to capital. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder if it might be useful to create something for mm -hmm. Marin and Northern California and then expand on it as far as being a public relations or a reference source, bringing together these various organizations. For example, um, there are programs in many organizations, whether it's PG&E, for example, if you are a low economic customer, then you can qualify for a certain programs. They, you know, their teams come into your home and green it, changing the light bulbs or mm. whatever might be needed. And these are ongoing. Uh, many people don't know about them. And one of the problems in any organization for success is its communication and its image. You know, the way mm -hmm. you present yourself. Yeah. That might be something, I don't know that it's economically feasible for a newer five-year company like yours, but you're in the business to be able to pull these threads together. And it may be something that you or one of the projects that, um, that you come up with in the future um, move into. So I wanted to suggest that. I also just wanted to mention something as I'm a, you know, as a lay person in this world, you're using vocabulary that I've never heard before and don't really know what it means. And I'm not completely, I've been living under a rock, thank goodness. But when you talk about, I don't need to know these things. I can go to your website, which I'd like you to, you know, I mess, I guess, venturepad.works. That works, that works, yes. Okay, that's, that works. Right. <laughs> and, and I, but I wanted to just let you know that when, you know, for the future, you know, accelerants and incubators and these different kinds of, of ways that you talked about certain kind of housing is J housing or something. I'm, I, I, I don't know what it is and um, it, it might help. Again, communication is key. I, I, I say that because that's my field. And so I'm, I always kind of trigger my mind to think about, about how we're doing that. So I just wanted to offer that as it's a little bit of uh, an insight. So thank you again very much. Thorough work that you're doing and great. And that makes me think of uh, some of the young people I'm working with who are in university graduate programs in sustainable um, education development mm -hmm. that I'm trying to plug in. So I'll send them your way. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I, I, I actually have, have taught uh, at, at Sonoma State uh, in, 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 the, in the intersection of entrepreneurship and sustainability. And, and it's a wonderful field. Um, even if you are coming out of non-environmental science oriented or, or uh, ecological uh, oriented majors, um, there's an opportunity for work and, and things are opening up, I think, for, um, 
for those who uh, young people, especially who, who really want to um, get lit up, you know, and also make a living, you know, by their work. So um, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. And, and I apologize for the acronyms. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do better next time. <laughs> so, uh, but I think this idea that you, you mentioned around um, better communications on the part of other nonprofits and about, and even the county supporting um, entrepreneurs and, important, and, 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 and supporting green businesses is an important one. Uh, how many of you, by show of hands, have heard of Project Drawdown? Okay. So Drawdown is the county's climate action plan. So um, if you Google Project Drawdown, comma, Marin County, you'll see uh, what Drawdown is. It's based on Paul Hawkins' book uh, mm -hmm. called Drawdown, which was you know, the top solutions to climate change. And um, the, 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 uh, the county took about six of those ideas, high potential climate change mitigation uh, ideas, and, and merged it and built it into their climate action plan. And this was about four years ago. And they got about 150 experts locally to volunteer and to sit on these task teams. And they figured out about six or seven shovel-ready projects and how to fund them, how to, how to staff them, how to actually execute them. And so um, I, I co-founded that group and about four, four years ago. And what we're really trying to build out is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a professional organization to execute the, the climate action plan instead of leaving it up just to the, to the county staff. So we're creating a board of directors. We've created a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we're populating that board and, and hiring an ED um, over the next uh, next year. So look look for uh, um, that uh, that organization because we're gonna we're gonna publicize um, this more and more for both businesses and nonprofits and 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 residents and, and uh, individuals. Um, has VenturePad considered having an app similar to Nextdoor Neighbor or? or patch the newsletter that comes out in Mill Valley as a means of communication um, of what's going on? I think, let, yeah, let me suggest that, that you look at um, a couple of, of good resources. We're, we're not necessarily in the business of specifically of climate change communications, although I think you know, having good resources um, and, and, and newsletters is important. I'm gonna, let me show, uh, or let me share with you a couple of good organizations that I like. One is, um, uh, is Drawdown Marin. And this is gonna be on the, the county website. If you were just to type in climate action plan or Drawdown Marin, you will see a calendars there. You will see latest updates on the plan and how it's getting executed. The other source that I really like is Green Change. Green Change is, a, is more of a, uh, a sort of a private individual household oriented um, kind of effort that promotes green behavior, products, programs, um, and, uh, and involvement as an as a individual, as a citizen. Uh, but they've also got things for, for small businesses called Green Change. Uh, they run monthly webinars uh, on various topics and really good organization. Um, the, the other organization that I really like is, is Sustainable San Rafael. And it's run, I think, really well. Um, just a really top-notch group of, of, of activists and, 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 and leaders in the community. Um, and um, so if you were to look at sustainablesanrafael.org, um, even, even though if you don't live in San Rafael, it's okay. It's still a, a great uh, resource for activities and information. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation again, Chris, and for everybody for your questions and your engagement. That was really, really helpful. Um, we will now move on to our next speaker. We have Herb with us. Uh, just to introduce Herb real quick, he has had a 32-year career with the UN Development Program, during which Herb had increasing responsibilities in eight countries, including as the UN's resident coordinator for economic development, as well as two senior assignments for policy and programs in the Africa and Asia departments. Since retiring from the UN in 2002, Herb's held leadership positions in the UNA USA as member of the National Council from 2010 to 2016, chair of the Advocacy Committee, a director and chapter president, and currently as president of the UNA's Northern California Division. So I'll pass it on to you and I'll pull up your slides in just a second. Great. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks, Juaria. Um, I want to thank everybody for being on this uh, uh, call, this Zoom, because you're showing an interest in something that's really important. I wanted to congratulate, of course, our friends here at UNA Marin. Uh, you've taken the lead, and it's wonderful to have a series uh, of these SDG programs. Um, and uh, there are now five chapters of UNA that are on the call this time, and I know there are some others. Uh, Chris, great job um, on uh, VenturePad. Uh, you have, um, as you can see on the screen, this is what I'm going to look at with you. Uh, is the world on track to meet SDG number nine? And of course, Chris was um, thinking uh, local, acting local in a broad context, kind of looking at things from 10,000 feet. Now we want to go back. Let's look at the whole planet. Uh, we're shifting from about 300,000 people to close to 8 billion people. and um, you know, the planetary view is quite different, although there are a lot of continuity, there's a lot of continuity between what Chris talked about. He used some words that you'll find even in my slides and in what I'm gonna present because you can't really think local and act local unless you're also uh, applying some of the same things to the global. So the three things I'm gonna cover uh, in a little less than 20 minutes so we can stay on schedule, I hope, um, is that I think, SDG number nine is really underappreciated. When most people think about the SDGs, they're thinking about other things like poverty and water and sanitation and women's rights and health and housing and jobs and things like that. SDG number nine is not so much something like that, an end in itself, but a means to a better end when we talk about infrastructure, industrialization, innovation. And I will elaborate a little bit on that too. Secondly, Chris even used some of the same words I've picked out too. There's a potential when you industrialize, when you invest in infrastructure or have innovation for some very, very good things. Also the potential to do some bad and ugly things because having an industry doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be for the good. And I'll elaborate a little bit on that. And then I would like to um, give you some examples of some progress toward the big topic there is the world on track to meet SDG number nine. And I have had, having worked in the UN system in uh, eight developing countries and been responsible for, uh, in some ways for all the countries in Asia and Africa at different times in my career, I've got some examples uh, uh, and uh, also some general indicators. So let's look to the next slide. Okay, I think it's worthwhile seeing, whoops, even though that spacing didn't come out quite right in the transmission. This is, let's peel apart what SDG number nine is. We need to see it in the context because we should ask ourselves, why did the countries of the world, 193 of them agree in, in 2015 to include this one when they were also looking at things like poverty and hunger and health and gender and all those things I mentioned before. So the, there are five uh, Targets, the big goal is to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, foster innovation. But most of these have to do with how you industrialize, sustainable and promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, resilient, affordable, equitable access. Number two, the goal that they agreed on is inclusive and sustainable industrialization, looking at employment and, and especially in developing countries. 
small scale enterprise, not just mega enterprises, a lot of small scale stuff as Chris referred to in Marin. Um, and this applies to other countries as well. The fourth one that the countries agreed upon, 193 of them, beneficiaries and, um, and developed countries is to upgrade the infrastructure. Again, sustainable with clean and environmentally sound technologies and processes. And the fifth target was to enhance the scientific research, the capabilities. This is the innovation kind of a thing. And I think we cut off the bottom few words in there, especially in the LDCs. Now, if you look at these words and the targets that they agreed upon, it is loaded, not just with industry infrastructure and, and uh, innovation, it's loaded with references to do it in a way that is sustainable, that is inclusive, that benefits everybody, not just the, the rich or the well-off countries, that is resilient, Chris used that word as well, that's environmentally sound, and there are several references in here in number two and number nine, uh, though it's cut off in nine, to helping the least developed countries. That's what the LDCs stand for. So they came up with these things because they, they see the need to look at this full range, but the wording is very, very important. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, um, infrastructure, industry, and innovation. Well, who cares? Well. If you ask people what are their favorite and most important SDGs, number nine is oftentimes not the one people focus on. In fact, there was a, a short survey done recently in the East Bay chapter, of which I'm a member. And <laughs> interestingly enough, industry was the last one on the list that people were interested in. Because they're always interested in those other things that seem more human and, uh, and directly relevant. So we got to come back to why is there this kind of low priority and little interest and does it matter? Then I mentioned also in the introductory comment, there are dangers for the good, bad and the ugly. Okay, among the things that can work in favor or against is, wow, well, all those people are trying to make a profit out of industry or an investment or countries that wanna get a return like the United States invests in petroleum in the Middle East or China's investing in these belt and road uh, projects all over the world or there can be investments that help the climate or that actually lead to more pollution and, and uh, worse off. Obviously we're seeing the growth of industry since the industrial revolution that has made a mess of the world right now. And then there are questions about how uh, and whether the benefits of industrialization, infrastructure and innovation are really gonna benefit everybody or whether they will benefit uh, some or whether it will take 10 years or 20 years to trickle down. And there's a means to get it to benefit all people. Chris mentioned the inequalities in Marin. Uh, so even when we look at the micro level in our own communities, obviously there's a difference between whether people are benefiting from industry and infrastructure and innovation or not. And that's a real problem, which makes it potentially ugly, even if you get industry <laughs> and innovation and infrastructure. And then just to deepen it a little bit further, I mean, I mentioned already, number nine is not really targeted to achieve equity to meet the basic human needs of people. Basic human needs being the water and sanitation, housing and food and, and jobs and income and everything else, nor are they necessarily number nine to protect the environment. So that's just elaborating on this. But the thesis is that I wanna be sure you take away is that as Jawari said in the introduction, number nine is interconnected. It's also essential. And as I said already, it's underappreciated. So why is that? Next slide. There's been a paradigm shift in the 1980s away from just industry for its own sake. And that feeds into all these ways that industry and innovation infrastructure have a bearing on so many of these other as, uh, sustainable development goals. These are, I think most of you are familiar with them, but the paradigm shift was instead of just having gross national product or the number of smokestacks as people like, used to say, or balance of payments or balance of trade or those things, those big macroeconomic indicators that the World Bank and the IMF were interested in, there became a focus on human needs, 
in the 1980s. There was a whole shift. Even the World Bank and the IMF adapted their approach. The US government adapted its approach, aid changed. And that was a forerunner of all these SDGs. Without that shift from gross national product and, and development, growth and development, there was a focus, let's put it in a human context. So industry becomes a means to com combat poverty. It is necess necessary to have some innovations, investments to raise food production, mm -hmm. to reduce hunger. The same thing for gender equality. Who's gonna participate? Are women gonna be included in industry or in innovations or are they gonna be left out? Water and sanitation, Chris mentioned those uh, and, and several of the ones in climate, 13, 14, 15 for Marin. Well, if you look at these, uh, there could be water benefits for everybody or ways to improve sanitation if the right innovations are made and transfer that know-how. On energy, clean energy, are we gonna shift clean energy? That was one of the goals. All the countries agreed to 193 of them, but you know, you can also have the massive investments in fossil fuels, which is still going on. The new investments in plastics, multi-billion dollar investments in the last few years in the United States to develop plastics from petrochemicals. Uh, the, the trend is still there to go in the wrong direction. But if, we, if, the, if the good industry, the good in, uh, innovation takes place, this can impact affordable, accessible, clean energy. Jobs and work, obviously, um, these can uh, this can provide security for people if there's um, a lot of uh, uh, income-oriented job creation. Uh, that's almost an automatic. Uh, influences inequality. I already mentioned the context of this, so you can see that the right kind of uh, of innovation and the transfer of the know-how can add to greater equality and equality of opportunities, or it could worsen it. Um, one of the other SDGs, these uh, 10, 11 are coming up uh, soon from the Marin chapter, as you know, um, and uh, sustainable cities is a very popular one. And it's directly related to what happens with the innovation and the industry and the infrastructure in cities. If it isn't good stuff, or if it's just benefiting the rich and you know, the right places, um, we're not going to achieve SDG number 11. Climate, I won't go into, you know, there's so many impacts and Chris elaborated on that. And number 17, I think is an important one. And I wanna come back to that in a moment, that it is indispensable that all the parties and all the partners are collaborating in infrastructure more and industry, more than maybe some of the other SDGs, both in the public and private sector. So my conclusion, take away from this in the broader context of what we're talking about today is that industry and infrastructure and innovation are means to inclusiveness, sustainability, equitable fulfillment of all the SDGs and they can help to meet human needs. If you don't take that away, you can get a cloudy picture of, about what is at stake in, um, in infrastructure industry and innovation. So let's go to the next slide, let's apply this um, to the, uh, the different partners that are involved in industry innovation and uh, infrastructure. And I put down two columns. I hope I'm right about Marin, Chris, and you all can correct me, but governments at all levels are needed at the international level to fulfill the SDGs globally and in Marin. Same thing, the private sector and private enterprise and their investments is necessary in both financing and financial institutions and banking, whether it's the World Bank or uh, the First Bank of, uh, of Marin, uh, you know, that's necessary. You need that partner involved or you're not gonna be successful in this SDG. Foreign investment mainly applies to international, but of course, if there's been foreign investment uh, in partners, joint ventures uh, uh, in uh, the Bay Area, that can affect Marin as well. Trade and trade agreements, directly, really relevant if you're in Africa or Asia and no one will take your product or you can't import certain, uh, if free trade isn't flowing and globalization's not taking place, you can't get your raw materials, you can't necessarily get uh, key input to, to build a machine or to, uh, if you can't even bring in cement uh, to, to, for construction. So trade is important. 
And of course, the U.S. trade policies can affect what's happening in uh, in Marin and in the Bay Area. Look at the bottlenecks right now about um, the, uh, the the flow of uh, raw materials and uh, the the blockage of everything that's uh, backed up in the uh, supply chain. So that does affect Marin as well as every other place. But it's key on the international level, and many countries have been held back because they don't have proper trade agreements or they can't import or export. International development assistance, obviously um, you're not getting international assistance in Marin or in California. Civil society and NGOs and community-based organizations, obviously a very important partner. So SDG number 17, which you'll get to <laughs> at the end of this long series of uh, programs that the um, Marin UNA are talking about and presenting to you, that's key. Uh, all seven of these potential partners are really playing a critical role um, in these. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so let me give you a few examples of something that I was involved in. I worked and lived in eight countries. Uh, and when I was in headquarters, I worked and oversaw all of African policy with a senior group of leaders and was responsible for the programs of the United Nations in uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia. So my first assignment in little Swaziland, that little country down there between Mozambique and South Africa, I was there a few years, five years after independence in the 1970s. They requested that they want to do something to establish more small enterprises. As Chris mentioned, these incubators, small little complexes where a number of enterprises can get some collective support uh, maybe credit, maybe advice, whatever it is. We had a project to help them establish a group of small enterprises. They were still doing plowing with people pulling a, a, some kind of a tool behind an ox or not, without an ox. We introduced harnesses and means in this country uh, so that they could improve their plowing to increase their agricultural yield, something as simple as that. Um, in Benin, in West Africa, where I went next, we helped them on an infrastructure project to assess what their minerals were. They didn't know, the French colonists had that information back in Paris, but the country didn't know whether they had anything to export or develop or process. They also had not worked on irrigated agriculture and there was a fantastic project that developed onions that were like this big up in the desert area in the north of the country from the Niger River. And they learned how to have simple irrigation so that they could use that heat to grow onions. In Angola, uh, where I was also based for a while, one of the innovations was how to demine all those landmines that had been placed during a 20 year civil war. There's an innovation, there's technology there somebody has to transfer it and bring it to Angola. That was a really, I was only in Angola for seven months and that was a fantastic project to see how there had to be that adaptation of that technology to get to places where there have been landmines. And there are at least uh, 30 countries in the world where landmines have been used in many where they are still placed to the detriment of people's well-being. Kazakhstan, where I was the head of the United Nations program for three years, look at the list there. They also wanted to set up small enterprises. Uh, I brought in somebody uh, through our offices in the UN to help them learn how to use microcredit, how they could get small loans and set up an institution for that. There was a lot on ecological protection. We in helped them introduce solar uh, energy in, in Kazakhstan. They didn't have any models, any pilots of that. They had been the victims of the whole nuclear testing program of the Soviet Union. That's where the Soviet Union exploded all its atomic and hydrogen weapons. And we brought in technologies to help them assess what the consequences of that were during the Soviet period when Kazakhstan became independent. They had almost no technology on how to uh, avoid the total collapse of buildings after earthquakes and in their capital city. So there was a project on that technology and to transfer that innovation so that they could do something about that. They were involved and asked our UN offices to help them on 30 year planning, long-term planning, like all the tigers in Asia, like Singapore and Taiwan and Malaysia and uh, Hong Kong and uh, Th Thailand, uh, Indonesia, they all had long-term plans. So they wanted 
to know what they could do to promote investment in things like and including not just smokestacks, but also in agriculture and environmental protection. They asked for a program in women's roles and how they could be more involved and what assistance the government could play in that. And there was the, during the time I was there, they were getting the first outbreak, outbreak of HIV AIDS and it was exploding. And the government was kind of blinkered about it for a long time. And they uh, agreed that we could bring in some technology, some innovations, some techniques to do that. In China, a huge range at the time of uh, the opening in China in the 1980s, when I was there for three years, they asked for the transfer of industrial technology to develop their industries in computer applications. They had very limited computer applications in some of their major industries, including the steel industry that uh, employed a couple million people. So we helped them on that. They were still making light bulbs with the filament technology, that little thing that burns for five hours or maybe 500 hours in light bulbs. And we brought in some assistance to help them uh, develop that. They were making silk for a couple thousand years, but they didn't have the right kind of dyes. Uh, their food production, they were obviously feeding a, a, a billion and a, and a third people, and they needed better ways to protect food and grow better yields and adapt seeds and storage and everything else. You can see this list. One of the interesting ones was uh, uh, geothermal development in Tibet. They couldn't do other kinds of energy because of the cold and the distance and the isolation. So the United Nations was asked to bring in the transfer, the technology to invest in geothermal, which is using the, you've got that up in Marin too, in, in your county with all those, um, the heat that's near the surface and you can, you can bottle it, you can use it to drive turbines. Um, another one, this TCDC I'll mention, because China also was, um, uh, had certain expertise, and this is the transfer of, uh, of technology uh, among developing countries. Uh, and they were using the United Nations as a way to demonstrate to other countries some transfer of know-how on small-scale irrigation, small-scale uh, hydropower, uh, on uh, barefoot doctors to transfer that know-how, how you could innovate to uh, help your countries. Uh, people. So there's a whole range and all these reflect like Marin in a way, but quite different. The needs of the area as demonstrated by the government saying we have these priorities and you can see they're all at different stages of industrialization and infrastructure and investment. Next slide. And uh, this is my last one so we can uh, move ahead shortly. But um, about global progress, Chris made reference to it briefly. I mean, some things that have really held back all the SDGs and also uh, this one, uh, number nine, the COVID crisis, uh, climate change and economic and uh, ecological disasters have slowed down uh, uh, number nine and the, those means and all those actors, uh, the partners who I mentioned in an earlier slide and the economy has slowed down in a lot of places in the last years since the SDGs were adopted in 2015. So those are some things that have slowed down the fulfillment of this SDG and a lot of others. Four things as just examples and then I'm done. Um, manufacturing and industry, which you saw is important in three or four of the targets, it's holding roughly steady. It, the goal is to increase the percentage of industry in all countries. But clearly the percentage of industry in the United States and the developing world is going down and it's going up in developing countries. So this is kind of stable, although it's shifting to the benefit of developing countries. So it's moving, whether they achieve the whole target by 2030, it remains to be seen, but the, the trend is right. Infrastructure, there's a huge investment, but again, it, some of it's beneficial and some of it's questionable. There's a lot of investment still in fossil fuels in uh, transportation that's uh, not clean transportation uh, or it's using building materials that, is, uh, that are not necessarily ecologically sound. Uh, and a lot of investment in water uh, around the world. China's doing the biggest investments now all over the world we know. And again, this is an iffy, the good, the bad, and maybe some ugly. Uh, so I'm not sure this is really on target. It's a very mixed picture. And the UN does not have good statistics on this. 
uh, but clearly we can observe this uh, quantitatively. On innovation and research and development, well, here are some great examples that we're aware of. Vaccine development, uh, uh, clean uh, uh, transportation like electric vehicles, renewable energy production from things like wind and solar. Those are innovations that are going on right now. Uh, so there's some really exciting progress to fulfill this target for the SDGs. But again, it's a mixed bag because sometimes that transfer doesn't take place fast enough. Look at the gap in how many countries are getting the vaccines. That's one we're hearing almost every day. Developing countries are way behind in getting access to vaccines. And then the internet, which is a, a very specific target and one of the only ones um, that's an elaboration. It's called the uh, target 9C. The goal was to provide internet access to all countries in the world by 2030. And it's on the rise. It's all roughly 60% now, and it's about 20% in Africa. And this is one of the better things that can be reported and is quantifiable. And it's considered to be on target to maybe fulfill that goal by 2030. So think of the global and how it relates to Marin, but how it's so very different and how it has to adapt. And again, bearing in mind that, you know, that there are key things like sustainable, equitable, uh, and that uh, contribute to economic development and social progress and, uh, and equity for uh, everybody to participate. So take that slide down and uh, there's time for a couple of questions. I ran a little bit over too. Thank you. No, that was perfect timing. We can quick round of applause and we can take any questions. If anybody has any, please unmute and go ahead. Um, is there any, I, well, I realize that in underdeveloped countries, this isn't really an issue. And I also realize that in, in Marin, um, I think we have the oldest average of people living to a high age um, in the state of California. This county has the oldest people in the state of California and maybe the U.S., so I'm just wondering if there's a consideration or a thread running through all of this that considers the needs of elders and um, the longevity that we have seemed to be a, achieving um, prior to COVID. I mean, I, I'm a little concerned that COVID could be cutting into um, the health of elders and the longevity uh, that we've been achieving, um, but it's important to consider in terms of infrastructure, transportation, um, food, and access to food, um, and, and because the longer you live, the harder it is. And yeah, well, look, uh, Judy, thanks for the question. I mean, it's a broad question. Uh, obviously, life expectancy has has doubled in developing countries in the last 40, 50 years, mostly due to health. And mostly many parts of that are due to the transfer of know-how, of innovations that have been developed, you know, in California or somewhere else in the developing world. Do they get to the developing world? Does nutritious food and high yield nutritious food get to these developing countries? Um, the whole health sector, the food sector, whether water is contaminated or not. These are all built into the SDGs to give people access to clean water. I mean, they even say access to clean water. So there's gotta be a lot of innovation and it won't happen unless there's innovation and investment in some kind of industries that are the means to that end. So again, I think it re your question reinforces the fact that there's a global need as well as in Marin as we all age hopefully we're all on, uh, to, to transfer that best know-how to everybody in Marin, including those who are least well off right now, uh, so that they can fulfill their potentials. And that's one of the challenges in the world. So industry's gotta be smart and the innovations have gotta be transferred. Hey, Herb, can I ask you a, a question? So it's rare that we actually get someone who's worked in the UN system and particularly someone like you at a, at, at a high level and, and but hands-ons and whatnot. 
uh, and some of us have, have, have done um, the model UN and that sort of thing. Can you tell us a little bit about what's your understanding of the dynamic, the atmospherics, um, how the, how these, these these targets would may have been developed, and and what is you know what what are countries in the uh, the members of the UN are countries, right? So they countries have interests. So uh, and I'm sure that everyone's got their talking points, and when they go to meetings, what, what's your feel about how that dynamic works out? What is it like? What is it? Is it the, the the big kids beating up on the little ones? Is it, what is the way it works? Well, uh, three things come to mind right away. Number one, on this call is Verena Borton and Ray Borton at the Davis chapter of UNA. And Verena wrote up something about how the process, the political process evolved for the development of each and the agreement for each one of the SDGs. It's a great resource and uh, maybe it could even be shared, uh, Verena. Uh, number two, um, the East Bay chapter, which I'm a member on the on the board, is running a program, and it was sent to many of you on this uh, in this program. Uh, we for our annual meeting, which is taking place next Sunday afternoon, but after the business meeting, we've got a speaker who was involved as the UN, the U.S. envoy to the United Nations, that led to the negotiation and the adoption of all the SDGs. A guy named Tony Pipa. He's, he's like one of the leading guys in the United States. Uh, maybe, uh, Bonnie, you can recirculate that flyer to all the people on this call, because we're going to look at that in the context of what the progress is and what the impediments are now, including COVID and climate and everything else. Um, the third one is that, obviously, there was a huge amount of, of negotiation back and forth. And I think industry is one of those that epitomize. I mean, nobody's going to object to ending poverty. No one's going to object to, uh, you know, um, uh, ending uh, hunger and premature death, or nobody's going to say girls shouldn't be educated. How that was developed and whether there was going to be an obligation that the rich countries would have to transfer X billions of dollars in 10 years, that was negotiable. So they didn't put in a lot of targets of who was obligated. They had to find something that would work. Joe Biden could learn something about that, maybe. Anyway, um, uh, so there was negotiation. So industry and, and infrastructure is a good one because you could say, well, the rich countries, Europe, the United States, Japan, China, uh, with its industrial might, would say, oh yeah, let's let's aim for more industry. We're going to get rich and we're going to have more influence and we're going to be able to develop products that we can import or we're going to be able to export our products if they've got. Uh, you know, they're going to build roads, we can, and uh, electric systems and water systems, we can export that. So, you know, there was inherently, for this SDG, an interest of the developed countries. And that's why I think the wording in this one is so important, because it's as if somebody sat down and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's be sure this is equitable, sustainable, resilient, and that's the kind of language that got in there. And many people think the UN is, you know, just talk, talk, talk. And there's a lot of talk that went into this. But, you know, if you get 193 countries behind it, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, there should be a huge amount of credit to the people like Tony Pipa and the United States and others and the people who compromised. Look at the setback on the climate negotiations in Glasgow where India, and I, I forget the other, was it Indonesia, some other country that didn't speak up, or Egypt and a couple others who said, oh yeah, we're not really going to, you know, phase out uh, coal. Sometime, maybe, but we won't set a target. We won't say we will phase out coal. So these are the kind of negotiations because every country's got a special interest. The good thing is that all 17 of these SDGs, they found a way to compromise. And uh, Verena is kind of... Uh, summarize that in her, her short uh, papers that were all published by a local newspaper. Thanks, Paul, for that question. And it's a, it's a really good one. I see Sue's hand is up. Thank you, Herb. You are um, a master at, um, and your passion, as well as with uh, Chris. Um, both of you as presenters have an enormous amount of knowledge and passion about what it is that you're talking about. And it brings, makes our interest even stronger. Um, because you mentioned about the iffy sometimes outcomes. And because Chris also mentioned about the, um, the, the whether we're doing, whether we're creating innovations 
and creating um, outcomes of, of what we look at as as worthwhile, you know, economically or for the for the public and for the humanity. Um, I just wanted to, as an aside, I hate to um, public um, to promote this, but um, there is going to be a Zoom on Monday morning about value creation and how we bring in the issues and how we can actually take these projects that we're working on, whether it's an SDG or um, um, sustainability for a business, how to find the value in it. It's something Hazel Henderson spoke about once of, of the before more than once, the triple bottom line where the value permeates all aspects of society. So I just wanted to mention that that is happening Monday morning. And if anyone is interested in learning more or participating, you can, um, Bonnie can send it to the information to the Zoom or I can as well. But yeah, I, I think that it's central elements. So um, that's a really interesting point. And I get, again, that is one of the real virtues and admirable things about the United Nations. If the countries didn't come to agree about certain values, including peace, equal access for all countries for economic and social development, uh, and the end of, uh, uh, and even now uh, environmental protection, I mean, fortunately, the values and the aspirations are there, even though the path to get there, including on the SDGs, is tough to achieve. If we couldn't fall back on values, uh, we would lose, I would lose hope. But I, I feel really, the, uh, from my experiences in all these countries and working in some regional negotiations, including, for example, a project I was involved in with China, Russia, Mongolia, South Korea, and North Korea for three years. I help facilitate negotiations with them. Very, very tough road, but they had, we found common values and interests and that's the secret of the United Nations and it's the secret of what we do, thinking and acting global and bringing it down even to the values and shared aspirations in Marin. Thanks everybody. I think our time is probably up. <laughs> it's up to you uh, leaders if you wanna continue. Chris and I are both game. Yeah, got all day. Hey Sue, Sue, real quick, um, what was that uh, gathering on Monday? Can you can you uh, point I, us I to can. a place? I can. Um, I it's it's because it has a Zoom link. We're not publicizing it, and your chat on this call is um, dis and, disabled. Disabled. Yeah. But um, but um, the the um, program is with the Creative Educators international network and it's based on value creation and it looks at how we we're all educators in whatever area of life we're in whether we're a consumer or a vegetable it doesn't matter we we have this within us and the idea of if, if i can get onto your um chris at venturepad.works i'll email it to you uh chris yeah that'd be and great i can email Body. And uh, Bonnie I, has a copy of it, and so uh, she can also email it since she knows your, you all know her okay. as your secretary and communicator. So thank you. It's it's about an, it's one hour orientation about the value creation, uh, the whole systematic of it, and because it's so integrated with the SDGs and with the the future of our planet that we're all working on in pieces in our own lives and the hope, as you say, Herb, in our own hearts, how to stay sustained within ourselves. And that is what will be able to help a sustainable, creative um, earth and planet for the future. So I'll send that to you, uh, Herb and, and Rita and um, Chris that I have your emails for. Great, thank well, you. Verena, it looked thank like you wanted to say something about the um, thing you published on uh, SDGs. You're muted. You're muted. There you go. I unmuted. You're unmuted now. Okay. Um, Herb confused what he presented as my work with what I actually did was writing about all the articles of the Universal Declaration of oh. Human Rights. Now, over a whole year <laughs> for the 70th anniversary. And uh, so I'm sorry, I can't claim credit for, for the SDG uh, writing. Okay, well, we'll give you an applause for what you did do on okay. all the, for the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and all of you who are organizing programs, 
bravo to, to Verena and backstopping with Ray. Okay. okay. Are there any other final questions, thoughts that anybody wanted to throw out? If not, we can wrap up. Okay, perfect. Thank you again, everybody, for being here. And thank you to both Chris and Herb for presenting such wonderful ideas. I know I learned a lot. So this was really great. Thank you so much for sharing your time and all of your expertise. Um, I know our chat function isn't working, but I just wanted to mention if anybody's interested in learning more about our chapter or is wanting to get involved with our board, we're always open to that. You can just um, Google search UNA Marin, we're the first page that pops up and you can find out more about how to get involved. The other thing I did want to mention is our next SDG event where we're going to be discussing SDG number 10, Reduced Inequalities. That is tentatively right now scheduled for Saturday, March 19th from 3 to 4.30. Um, we're going to be sending out more information as we get closer to that date, but pencil that in and please attend if you're able to. We would be happy to see all of you again. And with that, thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Well done, Juaria. Chris, Herb, Herb. Thank you, Herb. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Herb, if anyone can make SDG sound sexy, number nine, it's you. <laughs> It was much more appealing down the road. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm glad I turned you on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Marin. Great yep. job you do to do this series. Thanks, Herb. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Greta, you want to stay on with Juaria? Sure. Okay. And, uh, Paul, this is um, Greta. She's from um, Santa Mina Co High. She's joined our chapter. Welcome, welcome. And Hi, I, Greta. Just want, I just want to introduce Brenda to Roe. Excellent. Hi, Brenda. Brenda, Brenda's new. Hey, Brenda. There's Brenda. Hi, Brenda. There's Roe. Brenda. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> you're you're, you're muted. muted, muted, Brenda. <laughs> Still muted. There you, there you go. There you go. Now you may. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for joining us. Oh, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thanks Good for being. Capsulization of lots of information. <laughs> I want to thank you for being open to like popping on because that's what a lot of people have this kind of like resistance or questions. So I'm, I really appreciate you. Yeah. Being no, it's great. I, I almost went into international affairs as a major in college, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I studied. It's in my heart, you know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Greta, how did you, Greta, how did you come to hear about the U U UNA, uh, Marin, and uh, what's, what is your interest? Um, yeah, well, um, even since middle school, I was very involved in, as you know, Model United Nations. It's a very popular extracurricular activity. And so as I was entering college, I guess similar to Brenda, I'm applying um, to be an international relations major when I go to college next year. Um, so I was really looking for some other ways to get involved um, with international relations and diplomacy and human rights and whatnot. So I think I stumbled upon um, kind of just the whole UNSA organization, UNA organization as a whole. And then I had realized, oh, there's smaller chapters. And I had seen that there was the one in Marin County. And I was like, this would be a really great way to kind of find out more and then really delve into my research before I, I do it intensely in, in college as well. That's great. Yeah, and you were involved in uh, Model UN? Yeah, I'm leading it at my school this year. Oh, really? That's great. Yeah, that's excellent. Good, good for you. Well, let us know how we can help. Of course. Thank you. Yeah, I would love to be of any support if there is anything down the line, perhaps with, you know, like campaignings. I know that there was recently like the Ratify movement as well that the San Francisco chapter was doing. So anything like that is great to hear about as well. 
Okay, of course, yeah, we're always, you know, looking. And if you ever have any ideas of efforts that you want to, you know, include with what our chapter is doing, or if there's anything you see a need in the community and you want to bring it up, we're always open to that too. So yeah, we're a very informal bunch. You can always, you know, I think Bonnie passed on my email to you. So if you ever have any ideas or want to have a chat about anything, we're we're always happy to hear from people. Perfect. Thank you. Course, Greta, will the um, Model UN be open to other participants, other observers? You know, will it be live streamed or? Um, you know, it really depends. I think, well, you know, my school does a few separate chapters. Some of them, you know, debates and conferences are typically held in person. Um, as for this year, we did have, um, I believe, one virtual and there was supposed to be one in March called Berkeley Model United Nations. Typically, we go to other colleges locally like Stanford and Berkeley um, and do conferences there. And we're typically chaperoned by the by the teachers. Um, but in terms of other um, like observers, it it really depends. I think you'd probably have to contact the university or maybe even the high schools who attend them because I think they're the ones who have the regulation over who sees the Zoom meetings and whatnot. Because I know that some teachers in the past have been able to get access and watch their students um, participate in the debates and whatnot. So I think maybe 